conference from Wales, we now cross the Irish Sea to Northern Ireland. We're all aware of the current difficult political situation there, but this government is doing all it can to help resolve that and secure a better future for the people of Northern Ireland. So I'm extremely pleased to be able to introduce Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Theresa Villiers. Well, it's, it's such a great privilege for me to deliver my fourth party conference speech as Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. And of course, I am absolutely thrilled that for the very first time, I'm here addressing you as part of a majority Conservative government following that sensational election victory. And of course, it was an election victory that every single pundit and pollster said wasn't going to happen. And on the 7th of May, we were given a mandate to govern the whole of our United Kingdom. And we are doing so as a one nation government committed to bringing our country together. That includes Northern Ireland, where we will deliver our manifesto commitments and continue that great political journey, first begun by a Conservative government almost 20 years ago. That's a journey towards a more peaceful, stable and prosperous Northern Ireland where working people have the chance to get on to the best of their ability, regardless of their community background. It's a Northern Ireland which is secure within the UK on the basis of consent, and which we want to be a place no longer defined by its divided past, but instead by its shared future. This time last year, I stood before you, and I acknowledged that the devolved institutions were in real difficulty that political relationships were being damaged by disagreements on matters like flags, parading, and the past, and that a budget dispute threatened the whole future of the Stormont executive. Well, my realistic assessment then was that the time had come for a fresh round of cross-party talks, and these began very shortly afterwards with the five main Northern Ireland parties and the Irish government on matters falling within their responsibility. Those talks ran for 11 long weeks, and there were many times when it seemed as if a successful outcome was wholly unachievable. But after a final 25-hour long stretch of negotiations, the Stormont House Agreement was reached on the 23rd of December. That agreement has been widely acknowledged as a landmark achievement, including by the President of the United States. And I think we can take pride in the fact that it was a Conservative-led government which secured it. The agreement... <laughs> the agreement sets out a way to make progress on some of the most difficult issues facing Northern Ireland today, many of which have eluded previous attempts at negotiation. It provides a clear path to putting the finances of the Stormont Executive back on a sustainable footing for the future. It offers a way forward on flags and parades. It would establish broadly based institutions to help address the painful legacy of the past, offering better outcomes for victims and survivors. Institutions which are to be rooted in the principles of fairness, balance, and impartiality. And it contains measures to make devolution work better, including an official opposition for Stormont for which Conservatives have long argued. All of this was underpinned by a generous funding package which would give the executive two billion in additional spending power. But as that great peace process veteran George Mitchell reminded me earlier this year, getting agreement is about 20% of the job. The other 80% is actually getting it implemented. And for our part, the government is determined to do exactly that. So we've already passed legislation to enable the devolution of corporation tax powers. That's a change that could have a genuinely transformative impact on jobs and prosperity in Northern Ireland, not least because of the land border it shares with the low-tax jurisdiction. To take forward much-needed public sector reform, we've already released funding for the voluntary redundancy scheme contained in the agreement. And we'll soon be introducing a bill at Westminster to deliver new institutions envisaged on Northern Ireland's past. And today, 
I want to give you these assurances in relation to that legislation. As our Northern Ireland Manifesto made, made very clear, as we look back at the history of the Troubles, we in this party will never accept any form of equivalence between the police and soldiers who put their lives on the line to protect people from harm and defend the rule of law with the terrorists who waged a 30-year campaign of violence to inflict harm and subvert the rule of law. We in this party will never, ever accept any attempt to rewrite history or legitimise the actions of those who pursued their aims by the bullet or the bomb. And we will not countenance any form of amnesty for those suspected of criminal behaviour. Under this government, the law will always take its course. Under this government, the law will always take its course without fear or favour, and the bill we introduce will be wholly consistent with that fundamental principle. And I have to say that many will view with grave concern the fact that as recently as August, the leader the Labour Party have just elected was asked five times in an interview to condemn IRA terrorism, and five times he failed to do so. And while the, chance, the Shadow Chancellor, while the Shadow Chancellor might have issued a carefully worded apology for the hurt caused by his comments on the IRA, I say it's time he retracted in full his call to honour IRA terrorists and admit, admit he was entirely wrong ever to have made that statement in the first place. <laughs> and the Conservative Manifesto commits us to working with all parties to ensure everyone fulfils their obligations under the Stormont House Agreement. But progress in the Northern Ireland Executive stalled in March when the two nationalist parties withdrew their support for crucial provisions on finance and welfare reform. We are clear this government will not fund a more generous welfare system in Northern Ireland than it does in the rest of the UK. There is no more money. Without welfare reform and efficiency measures to deal with in-year budget pressures, the executive's budget simply doesn't add up and pouring millions of pounds every week into an unreformed, high-cost welfare system in Northern Ireland means less and less money available for frontline public services. As a direct result, NHS waiting times are already getting longer, and the pressure will only increase in the weeks to come. The government cannot stand by and let this situation drag on indefinitely with Stormont increasingly unable to deliver key public services. That's why I've confirmed that we're prepared to legislate at Westminster for welfare reform in Northern Ireland if that becomes necessary. Now, it would be a last resort. It's an outcome we're striving to avoid. And that's one of the reasons why we acted swiftly to reconvene intensive cross-party talks now underway once again to try to break the deadlock. Now, it's probably too early to say with certainty whether they'll succeed, though I sense a genuine willingness on all sides to make progress. But time is short. Unlike last year, we simply don't have the luxury of endless long hours of discussion stretching on and on and on until Christmas. Because what's at stake is not just the credibility of devolved government in Northern Ireland, but the survival of devolved government in Northern Ireland. One only has to look around Europe to see the terrible problems caused when an administration can't live within its budget and the terribly harsh impact that can have on some of the most vulnerable in society. Replaying that scenario in Northern Ireland would stretch political relationships well beyond breaking point. And there's now a real risk that those taking a hard line against welfare reform could end up running the devolved institutions into collapse as collateral damage. A return to direct rule would be a severe setback after everything that's been achieved over recent years, and we are doing all we can to prevent it. What Northern Ireland needs is an effective, devolved, power-sharing government 
that's capable of making the kind of difficult choices on spending priorities, welfare, and public sector efficiency with which more or less every other administration in the developed world has had to grapple in the years since the crash of 2008. That's what we're striving to achieve. But these talks aren't just about implementing the agreement, crucial though that is. In recent months, the fallout from two brutal murders on the streets of Belfast has highlighted the continued presence of paramilitary organizations and the involvement of some of their members in criminality and organized crime. Let's be very clear. Paramilitary organizations have no place in a democratic society. They were never justified in the past. They're not justified today, and they should disband. So a second key aim of the talks underway is to try to find a way to bring an end to that continued blight on Northern Ireland society. These are very serious matters, as is the continuing terrorist threat from distant Republican groupings. They maintain both lethal intent and the capacity to mount lethal attacks. And I would like to put on record today the deeply felt gratitude of this government and this party for the outstanding work done by the Police Service of Northern Ireland in defending the community from terrorist attack. And I think it's always important to stress that there is so much to be positive about in today's Northern Ireland. After being hit hard by Labour's Great Recession, the economy there is growing again, expanding opportunity for hardworking people. There are over 32,000 more people in work than when we came to office in 2010, all now given the security of a pay packet to support their families. Belfast is one of the most attractive destinations in the country for foreign direct investment. Year after year, Northern Ireland's young people outperform England and Wales at GCSE and A-level. And last month, County Fermanagh was officially named as the happiest place in the United Kingdom. So in conclusion, I consider myself to be immensely lucky to have been given the chance to serve as Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. And whilst, yes, there are times when the situation looks grim and the divisions seem impossible to bridge, there are three reasons why I approach this latest round of cross-party talks with hope and even just a glimmer of optimism. Firstly, I have an outstanding team around me, and that includes Ben Wallace, Andrew Dunlop, Charles Elphick, Rebecca Harris, and Jonathan Kane, who grapple with all the many challenges thrown at them with both dedication and enthusiasm. Secondly, I report to a Prime Minister whose very real affection for Northern Ireland and its people means that he has been unstinting in his support for all the painstaking work needed to keep the political process up and running despite all the bumps in the road of the last few years. And thirdly, and most importantly of all, I believe that Northern Ireland's leaders do want to make the political settlement work. They do want to find a way to resolve the two crucial questions about which I have addressed this conference today. Success or failure over the coming days lies in their hands. They have rightly received praise around the world for all they achieved in reaching the 98 peace settlement, which has transformed life in Northern Ireland for the better. If we're to build a brighter, more secure future for everyone, now is the time to show that same spirit again. I believe they can do it. A resolution is possible, and I will be working with perseverance and determination to see that happen. Thank you.